Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash for This Week in Prophecy, November 5th, 2018. Jacob. Blessings of Jesus, dear friends. Wonderful to be with you. Our particular thanks to those who joined us in the Scottish Conference. It was tremendously blessed of the Lord with myself and uh, David Noakes, who spoke extremely well. Um, it was a time of, indeed, edification for the body of Christ in Scotland who want to hold on to the faith of their fathers, such as the Covenanters. Despite the post-Christian nature of Scotland, there is a godly, godly cater of people up there, and we're privileged that so many of them are on our mail list and attend our meetings and our conferences. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. My thanks to the Lord and to them. But let's proceed with this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy is rather complicated because the American elections will be taking place tomorrow. We'll have the results within 36 to 48 hours, and therefore we'll need to webcast and to broadcast on Roku a supplement or an addendum following the election results. But what I'd like to point out in terms of prophecy, as we see in Daniel and Revelation and in Zechariah and in another aspect in the book of Job, there is a conflict taking place in the heavenlies that has ramifications for what's happening on the earth. This is true of the Brexit battle in Great Britain. It is certainly true of the American elections. God has been giving Britain and America an undeserved season of respite, which has driven not simply the establishment crazy, but driven the principalities, the powers of darkness and of the air crazy. To have an American president who's so pro-Israel and at this point sympathetic to evangelicals, relocating the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, an American president who did that, despite the fact that liberal Jewish Americans, such as Debbie Washerman Schultz and Senator Charles Schumer and Senator Blumenthal, didn't even attend the ceremony. Um, it shows you what their Jewish identity means to them. They would go with the Democratic Party, where only 21% of the people are supportive of Israel, as opposed to the Republicans, where 83% are supportive of Israel. And I'm not a Republican, I'm an independent. And I dislike the Republican Party establishment as much as much as I dislike the Democrats, as most of you know. I'm not trying to use a Christian broadcasting or Christian webcasting platform for any political purposes or to endorse any party. But we are simply trying to look at the spiritual realities and the prophetic significance of what's happening. This is an ongoing battle in Great Britain with Brexit. There are people who want a second Brexit vote. The left in the United States are seeing the congressional elections as a second vote on Donald Trump. Because they failed to defeat him electorally, they're going to try to make a move towards impeachment in the House of Representatives. Politically, it won't fly in the Senate, but they're going to try to do it in order to disrupt and discredit the second half of his first term as president in the hope that that will help help them electorally uh, in, in the next presidential election. That is their thinking. Again, these are unprincipled people. But on back of this are spiritual battles. On back of these things are spiritual battles. As we've said repeatedly, the European Union is of prophetic significance. They are trying to make the iron stick to the proverbial clay, as Daniel said. <coughs> it is the Lord who establishes and removes kings. The Democratic Party in the United States has been slaughtered in three consecutive congressional elections. Under Barack Obama, the most failed political leader in the history of modern American politics under the Democratic Party, approximately 1,000 seats were lost in state senates and legislatures across the United States. They lost control of the Senate and of the House of Representatives and indirectly their domination of the Supreme Court. He 
had the one saving grace that he did more damage to the Democratic Party than anyone in probably its history in terms of elections. Now they are desperate to see that reversed and to see the election tomorrow in the United States as a referendum on Mr. Trump. In Great Britain, you have a vehement anti-Israel leader of the Labour Party, roughly the equivalent of the American Democratic Party, extremely left-wing now, threatening to move Britain in an even more anti-Israel direction than it already is. These people have an anti-Zionist agenda, and the Labour Party, as we speak, its leading figures, or many of its leading figures, are under investigation by the police for hate crimes. Now that says something. The police are objectively investigating the British Labour Party for hate crimes because of their anti-Jewish statements, not just anti-Zionist, but anti-Semitism. This having its counterpart in the United States in the atrocious shooting attacks in Pittsburgh, in which when Mr. Trump visited, pray condolences and respect to the community and the victims and the families of the police who were shot, the left organized political protests against him when he was there simply to bring consolation as the president to the victims of a of a ugly, unspeakable hate crime that took the lives of 11 innocent people and shot others. Well, this is the nature of the conflict. It's becoming more and more violent. We are seeing the left getting more and more violent, more and more anti-Semitic, more and more anti-Israel, and more and more incensed against Christians. The recently retired directress of Planned Parenthood stated upon her retirement that the federal government should force evangelical Christian medical staff, GYNOBs, surgical theater nurses, anesthesiologists who oppose non-therapeutic abortion to perform them anyway. The federal government should force Christians to abort babies. That is what she said. This is the kind of barbarism we are dealing with. Incitement of violence by major political figures. People saying things after a Republican member of the House of Representatives was shot while playing softball in Virginia didn't stop Maxine Waters from urging people to harass members of the administration in restaurants and in, 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 in petrol stations and in, in filling stations. Hillary Clinton saying the same. If senior administration they are getting more and more desperate, States more and more vicious. Just listen to a five second clip of Elizabeth Warren. Or you have homosexual Senator Cory Booker who admitted guilt to sexual harassment in the 1990s, now accused of it again, but the media is overlooking it. Or the sexual violence alleged against Keith Ellis, the Islamic deputy chairman of the Democratic National Committee, member of the House of Representatives. The media is more than willing to ignore it. Now we know that there was sexual harassment against a member of Hillary Clinton's campaign, a woman, and she did nothing but protect the alleged perpetrator and transfer the victim. Yet publicly saying a woman who claims sexual attack deserves to be believed simply because she's a woman. Because you're a woman means you tell the truth, and because you're a man, it means you're guilty, she says publicly. However, when it happens on her own electoral staff, it was the opposite. In fact, when she was the first lady, she attempted to excuse her husband's own behavior with Monica Lewinsky by saying that she had reached adult age, albeit narrowly by that time. As a lawyer, Hillary Clinton defended sex offenders males. 
this is the kind of hypocrisy and corruption we are dealing with. This is the vehemence. There is a spiritual force on back of it. I am not suggesting the Republican Party is any less vicious or any less corrupt. Not by a long shot. Again, I have no loyalty to either party. The Republican Party establishment is, again, vehemently opposed to President Trump and always have been. The Bush family, Mitt Romney, people of this nature, they are no friends of the administration. Mr. Trump has had to run against both parties in effect. We've said this before. Again, we're not politically endorsing any candidate. We are simply saying that from a prophetic perspective, there is a spiritual battle over Great Britain concerning Brexit and a spiritual battle over the United States concerning the midterm elections. In Great Britain, it's the same. Being in the Tory or Conservative Party does not mean that they're less corrupt than the Labour Party. The Tory Party is dominated by people in their establishment who want to remain in Europe against the democratic will of the British people. They're calling for a second referendum. They are following the corrupt politics of the Republic of Ireland. Corrupt, certainly, in the ethical sense, where every time the Irish people voted to get to disentangle themselves from Europe to any degree in a referendum, the government would just call for a second referendum and a third one until the political establishment of the Republic of Ireland got the result they wanted. If they lost an election, if they lost by referendum, by public opinion, they'd simply demand another referendum and then another one. It is only the one that they get that they want that stands. Then there'll be no more referendums. But if it's a democratic choice of the people that the establishment doesn't want, if it's something that is not pro-European, they'll hold another referendum. This is the kind of sickening politics of the Republic of Ireland. Now, we have to understand how this works. The Republic of Ireland's first Taoiseach, his first prime minister and later president, was Eamon de Valera. He was born in New York City, in Manhattan, during the era of Tammany Hall. He came as a boy to Ireland, but he was born in New York in the era of Tammany Hall. Now, understand what I'm saying. I'm not anti-Irish. My mother's family is Donegal Irish Catholic. I was just in Donegal speaking the week before last. I love Ireland. I love the Irish people. I'm simply stating facts. At the time De Valera was born, you had corrupt political machines taken over by the Irish Catholic populations who had been discriminated against, put into shanty towns during the immigration during and after the Civil War, who were embittered, having seen the kind of prejudice they experienced in Great Britain and in Ireland in the aftermath of the potato famine coming to America, they began to experience the same thing in the United States. There were signs that factories, Irish need not apply and things like this. This caused an embitterment of Irish America very similar to what you see with black America, very similar. In fact, the same neighborhoods inhabited by the Irish, such as Harlem, uh, would later become Afro-American neighborhoods, was the same kind of thing. Well, they took over cities and built political machines to stay in control and extract vengeance against the, what they saw as the Protestant establishment. These machines eventually became all democratic. In Boston, it was run by the Kennedys in the 20th century. In Chicago, Cook County was run by the Dailies. In New Jersey, it was run by someone called Frank Haig and J.V. Kenney. In New York City, it was run by Jimmy Walker and all of these crooked mayors of New York and lasted all the way until the late 1960s. Tammany Hall was one of these predominantly Irish-American political machines defined by corruption. 
often in league with the Italian mafia, often in league with the Italian mafia. The Italian mafia was able to flourish to a degree because of the corruption of the politicians in Chicago, Boston, New York, and so forth, because the Irish Catholic politicians controlled the police, district attorney's offices, prosecutor's offices, things of this nature. Law was emphasized as a faculty to study in in Roman Catholic universities, such as Notre Dame, which was predominantly Irish at one time, Georgetown University, and so forth. These Jesuit institutions particularly all had law schools, and they pushed Irish Catholics into this political machine. Thus, they controlled law enforcement. It was a very corrupt era. It went through prohibition. You had Irish gangsters in league with Irish politicians during prohibition. One died last week, murdered in prison, Mr. Bolger, Whitey. He was the last of them. But there was a time when there was a lot of gangsters who were Irish. They were not all Italians and never have been. They were Jewish gangsters. Lansky being the last major Jewish one was Maya Lansky, Whitey Bolger being the last major Irish one, John Gotti being the last major Italian one. Now American organized crime is more Russian mafia and Latin American drug gangs and things of this nature. But it was all ethnic. And it was from this that the Republic of Ireland got its backing. The money and political muscle of the United States Irish American community was instrumental in the rise of Irish nationalism and republicanism. Eamon de Valera would have been hung by the British if he didn't have an American passport, most likely. Um, much the same as the provisional IRA, the era of terror in Northern Ireland was funded from America. That was not something new. Uh, of course, the claims of early republicanism were different. Early Irish republicanism were partisans. They were not terrorists and gangsters. They had legitimate complaints in their struggle with the black and tan, with British colonialism and so forth. The modern IRA is something very different um, than, than their forebearers, who they claim to be their forebearers, such as Michael Collins. But Eamon de Valera was responsible for destroying the Irish, the original Irish Republican army in the Republic of Ireland. He came again from New York. He was born on Lexington Avenue in Manhattan. His parents were groomed in this political environment. His father was in fact Hispanic. His mother was Irish. And he came to, back to Ireland having family and having an American passport and having his financial and political base back in the States where you had these political machines. Again, this lasted into the 1960s and 70s. When Bobby Sands died, one of the Irish hunger strikers, who was ironically half Protestant, when he died, there were protests outside of the British uh, mission to the UN in New York and outside the British consulate. And Irish American women imitating the women they saw in Andersontown and Belfast in Catholic neighborhoods began bashing dustbin lens in protest on the sidewalk in front of the British diplomatic missions. And of course, the, the missions were under literal siege. And when the police came, the police were all Irish, or at least most of them were Irish. Um, it, it caused a big, big mess. Irish American political power should not be underestimated. This is what produced De Valera and this introduced organized political corruption into the modern state of Ireland. We have to go back to understand the history of it. It is the issue of Brexit that is the sticking point, magna cum laude, in the British withdrawal. Putting up a border with customs and taxation between North and South, Northern and Southern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, 
would to the Republican community and to the Irish Catholic community seem like undoing Good Friday, undoing the peace agreements. Now we were integrating and becoming one Ireland economically, at least. And that would have led to some kind of social and political harmony and was doing so. And now you want to put up a border again. This is a main problem in Brexit. But again, there are spiritual powers on back of this. Within the last few months, the Republic of Ireland, already having become the first country in Ireland to have same-sex marriage, legal, the first country in, the, in, in Western Europe to have legalized same-sex marriage, the first country in Western Europe in the EU to have an openly, publicly avowed homosexual prime minister who, like De Valera, is only half Irish, he's half Hindu and half Irish, Mr. Vatica. Now Ireland has voted for non-therapeutic abortion to legalize abortion as a form of birth control. The only place in Ireland or in the United Kingdom where non-therapeutic birth control is still illegal, <clears throat> where you can't kill an unborn baby for purposes of mere birth control. The only place in the UK or the Republic of Ireland now where you do not see mosques springing up all over the place because Angela Merkel and the European power bloc dictates that you must take these Muslim refugees in if you're in the EU. Germany is the paymaster, and whoever pays the piper calls the tune. That's not happening to the same degree, at least in Northern Ireland. Abortion as a form of birth control is not there in Northern Ireland. Neither is same-sex marriage legal in Northern Ireland. It's the only place in the United Kingdom, just about the only place in the EU, uh, at least in Western Europe, and the only place in Ireland you don't have these things. What you see in the United States, for instance, the establishment of the Republican Party is not ideologically very different than what the Democratic Party had been. In fact, in many respects, the Republican Party as it is now, the mainstream Republican establishment, is what the Democrats used to be. When you had centrist and right-center Democrats, people like JFK, or people like Senator Scoop Jackson, or, or, or Sam Nunn, or Senator um, Patrick Moynihan, those people ideologically are closer to Republicans like Romney or the late John McCain than the than they are to what the Democratic Party has become now. It's very mixed up. Ireland was the same. You have Fine Fáil, Fine Gael, Sinn Féin, but the party of, of Eamon de Valera, again, took this institutionalized corruption of American politics controlled by Irish-American politicians in the Midwest and in the Northeast and in New England and innovated it for Ireland. It was an American model of institutional corruption that exists to this day in Ireland. The only difference was the Roman Catholic Church had a, a level of support and influence in Ireland it could not have attained in the United States because of Protestantism, evangelicism, and, and Jewry, and so forth. That was the only real difference. But it was the product of... of Irish America. Those are the people who supported de Valera against the British. Those are the reasons the British could not go beyond a certain point. It was because of the American connection. Uh, now it's all come to a focus once again in Brexit. That border between the six counties of Northern Ireland and the Republican Ireland is now a historical symbol. It was an artificial border in the eyes of Irish people that was coming down. But now with Brexit, in their perspective, their mind's eye, it's going up again. There's a fear of a return to violence or that it will galvanize support for radical republicanism and refuel the provisional IRA once again. These are all fears 
perhaps being propagated by pro-European political interests to try to stop Brexit. They will try anything. There's no end to it until Jesus comes. I don't think there'll be a lasting peace in the Middle East until Jesus returns. Neither do I think there'll be a true and lasting peace in Ireland until Jesus returns. But realize, these things have historical roots, and they are all underlined by a spiritual conflict. There are spiritual battles on back of Brexit, and there are similarly spiritual battles on back of the American elections. After the Kavanaugh defeat for the left, there's a battle for the Supreme Court. The strategy of the left has been when you cannot win democratically in elections, you get agendaist judges to legislate from the bench. You appoint people like Sotomayor. You appoint people of like Ruth Carter Ginsburg. You appoint people of that nature who are agendaists, who do not believe in constitutional uh, they do not believe in a per se constitutional judiciary, but they believe that judges should decree the law instead of Congress legislating. Now, Congress is more than happy to do this because politicians can lose votes. If they're pro-same-sex marriage, they can lose votes. If they're anti, they can lose votes. But if the courts decide it takes the responsibility and the heat off of politicians who only care about getting reelected. This is what's going on. There's a battle for the Supreme Court and it's spiritual because it brings into question Roe versus Wade, non-therapeutic abortion. It brings into question by what right did the Supreme Court constitutionally mandate same-sex marriage to be legal? When the Constitution says if there's an issue upon which the Constitution is silent, the states should decide. Every state should have a referendum whether to allow same-sex marriage or even marital unions constitutionally. But you get a corrupt Supreme Court stacked with agendaists driven by a left-wing ideology. It doesn't matter what the Congress says or even what the public says. You can push this. You can impose it by judicial means. You can't beat Donald Trump at the ballot box, so impeach him. Bring up ridiculous, unsubstantiated charges of collusion with Russia, when the only one who's colluded with Russia so far seems to have been Democrats. Do anything. Lie. She deserves to be believed simply because she's a woman. He's guilty. These people are anti-democracy. They are truly left-wing fascists. Now, they will try to tell you Antifa. We're anti-fascist. Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler were both socialists. Nazism, the Third Reich, was a socialist movement, the National Socialist Workers' Party. It's the same spirit that was on back of Stalin, the same spirit that was on back of Hitler. You must perform those abortions. Your faith will become a crime if you do not perform those abortions, doctor. If in deference to your religious convictions, you don't do it, your faith is encouraging criminal activity. Much the same as a Muslim blowing up skyscrapers has his faith encouraging criminal activity if he claims it is jihad. They want to make an equivalence, equivalency between the two. This is the left. These are the things at stake in the election. It's not just politics. It's spiritual. It's not just morality. It's a conflict between the angelic and the demonic, between the divine and the satanic. It is urgent that we pray at this particular time for Great Britain and Brexit, and for the outcome of the midterm elections. Again, 
I cannot endorse any party or any candidate. I am simply elaborating on not merely the political realities, but the prophetic realities when we observe these things from God's word. Remember, in Israel, there were conflicts over cooperation with the paganism in the time of the Maccabees. In the book of Daniel, chapter 11, it was all predicted and it happened. These social political issues were simply the reflections of spiritual conflicts in the heavenlies. We see the same in the book of Zechariah. What was transpiring in history in the book of Zechariah was a reflection of that battle before the throne of God that we see in Zechariah chapter 5. Book of Job from another aspect similarly. Book of Revelation very much the same. What we are seeing are simply the political outworkings of realities which are spiritual. I would certainly urge Christians to vote urgently. I would certainly even more urgently urge Christians to pray. The election will be known within the next 36 hours or so, and we will do an addendum. Let's continue with this week in prophecy. What is not being said? We have been speaking much in recent weeks concerning the deployment of the S-300 anti-aircraft and anti-ballistic missile systems that Russia has placed in Syria using Iranian crews, including Iranian crews with Russian advisors and very advanced radar detection systems that are not simply guidance systems, but detection systems of Israeli and American aircraft. This week in prophecy, almost no one is talking about it. The Americans and Israelis, the Israeli Air Force deployed in Europe using F-35s and other advanced aircraft and modified F-15s most probably have been conducting aerial warfare maneuvers with jet fighters in the Ukraine close to the Russian border, where not only the S-300, but the more advanced S-400 and S-500 Russian missiles are deployed. Whether this is mere posturing or whether it is experimentation, to develop countermaneuverable technologies or modification in existing avionics technologies to circumvent the accuracy of the S 400s and S 500s. I do not know. I don't know if anyone other than the planners in the Pentagon and the Israeli Ministry of Defense know. The Russians, Mr. Putin, would love to know. Nonetheless, Mr. Putin now has a situation where if he's going to have the Russian Air Force flying near Israel's borders in Syria, he's going to have the Israeli Air Force flying near Russia's borders in the Ukraine along with the Americans. High level of defense cooperation. And it's happening this week in prophecy. It's happening with the backing of President um, Peter Poroshenko or Petro Poroshenko, a Ukrainian who is a Ukrainian nationalist. He knows what Mr. Putin is and what Mr. Putin is not, and he's friendly to Israel. So are the Cypriots at present. Israeli, British, and American special forces are known to be practicing mountain warfare and a terrain very similar to central Iran, where the Iranian nuclear facilities are mainly located in their drive to acquire an atomic weapons capacity. These are taking place in the mountain regions of Cyprus. It's the closest looking terrain to what exists in Iran, to which the Israelis and Americans have a proximal training ground to carry out operations, and they're practicing them almost daily. 
the Israeli Sayeret or Sayerot are certainly there, as are American special forces, and almost certainly Royal SAS and SBS. Again, there are two sovereign British bases in Cyprus, which are the staging grounds for both covert American and Israeli operations. Undoubtedly, the United States has a hand in persuading the British to open that kind of cooperation with the Israelis. But it is happening, and it is happening this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Mr. Pompeo has told Iran they have a choice between their present destructive behavior and attempting to acquire nuclear weapons and advanced delivery systems in the form of missiles and continuing to support terror. That is destructive behavior. That is one choice. The other is economic disaster. The Iranian currency is worth about one third of what it was against the US dollar a year ago. Oil production in Iran has declined by about 1 million barrels a day. But now the American sanctions on the 5th of November have kicked into high gear. This coalition of efforts that were global against the American action that included the European Union who were making profits by dealing with the Iranians despite Iranian sponsorship of terror. Russia and China have not made a difference. The economic muscle of the United States was applied in such a way as European industries and corporations were told if you were going to deal with Iran, you cannot deal in the United States. There were also actions in the financial markets, including the SWIFT, which is the SWIFT is the banking exchange system for international currencies. It's caused a lot of problems for Iran, but as of today, as of the 5th of November, those problems have been very, very seriously ratched up. Very seriously ratched up. Now Iran is really going to begin to feel the effects of the American embargo. It is obvious that the United States has a plan, a coordinated effort, to turn Iran into the Venezuela of the Middle East. Despite its oil resources, Venezuela's economy continues in a downward spiral, causing social and political unrest. The same is beginning to take place in Iran. Because of fracking and because of Saudi cooperation under Mohammed bin Salman, the oil weapon is no longer what it was. The Americans are, on one hand, preventing a spike in oil prices, which they don't want to do at an election time, but they want the prices high enough to make their own fracking efforts financially viable. They don't want the prices to go too low because it will help China, but they want them to go low enough that it will harm Iran, Russia, and Venezuela. No one will tell you this, but oil analysts know that is what is happening. To make fracking viable, the prices have to be kept reasonably high, but not so high that it is going to create another economic boom for Russia or give Iran the capacity to bail itself out. Remember, the economies of Venezuela and Libya, despite being oil rich, are not being helped by the petroleum reserves. They are not being helped by it. It is a different world and a different market now. The Saudi Arabians know well the threat of Iran and the fracking in the United States has made the United States the biggest producer. It has changed the equation immensely. This week in prophecy, these things are coming to a head. The Iranian response has been colorful. 
the president of Iran went to the assembly line of the Iranian Kausar fighter plane and sat in a cockpit to have his picture taken. I do not think that the Iranian Kausar fighter plane would perform well even against an Israeli F-15, much less an F-35 or a rapier F-22. But it is a good photo op, a good Kodak moment for him, as it were. Mohammad Ali Jafiri, commander of the Republican Guards, and the commander of the Al-Quds Brigades, that is, the commander of Iranian forces operating outside of Iran in the Middle East, uh, Qasem Soleimani, gave forceful, powerful speeches a la Goebbels, how they're going to stand up to the Americans, essentially saying they're already at war. At the same time, while the Israelis and Americans are training, probably with the British, in the Trudeau Mountain Forest of Cyprus and carrying on aerial maneuvers near Russia in the Ukraine. The Israelis are at the same time carrying out massive defense practice operations called Operation Blue and White Flag. Iran, however, is carrying out its own operations. Going back to 2011, when an American drone was captured by Iran that was launched probably from inside Afghanistan during the Obama administration. Having captured this drone that was downed inside Iran, the Iranians built a copy called the Segi stealth drone. They actually were able to launch 11 of these drones from Iran flying over Iraq, allegedly undetected by the Americans, by the Israelis, or by the Jordanians, striking ISIS targets inside of Syria. Iran does not like ISIS because ISIS is Sunni, Iran is Shia. And, by some accounts, successfully returned to Iran. They got a prototype by capturing one American drone that invaded Iranian airspace, either intentionally or unintentionally, during the Obama years. They copied it, and they've copied it successfully. It's, they have the drone itself, but it's capable as a delivery system for the 345 Sadid glide bombers. These are being deployed up and down the eastern shore of the Persian Gulf by the Iranians. They are formidable, but they are definitely also Iranian saber rattling. The Iranian response so far has been to say that they will fight the American embargo with oil, which isn't going to happen on any grand scale. And of course, saying it's a military conflict. This pushes the possibility of armed conflict between the United States and Iran further to reality. Armed conflict between Israel and Iran further to reality, and armed conflict between Saudi Arabia and the Emirates further towards reality, bearing in mind the complicated situation that exists in Yemen and in Qatar that we've discussed in previous weeks in prophecy. These things are coming to quite a head. It is rumored that there have been secret Israeli Air Force attacks inside Syria that have not been announced. How many? No one knows, and no one knows for certain if these rumors are true. But there have been no announced Israeli attacks now in over six weeks on Syria since the deployment of the S-300. However, there have been Israeli air maneuvers in eastern Lebanon, and there have been Israeli air maneuvers in eastern Ukraine. Mr. Putin must realize it is a two-way street, and he's certainly realizing it this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, 
a proposal for a ceasefire with Hamas in Gaza was communicated from Egypt or via Egypt by the Assisi government. Hamas was demanding the Israelis pay $15 million a month to stop the balloon transported incendiary devices from setting forest fires in Israel. The Israelis declined. They'd be paying for a false peace, and the Netanyahu government, of course, declined. Thus, they're back to step one. The Israelis have not been hitting the Hamas targets in Gaza for the last two to two and a half weeks in the hope the Assisi government of Egypt could broker some kind of ceasefire. But what has been offered is basically extortion. You'll pay us for a false peace or we will continue. Well, the Israelis responded with shoot to kill against rioters who exceeded the limits of Gaza's border coming into Israel. Mr. Netanyahu refused to pay tribute to a terrorist organization that Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the British Labour Party, will declassify as terrorist if he is elected. But these things happen this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Iran also made the accusations that Israel attempted a massive cyber attack on Iran on various computer systems. The Iranian Minister of Communication, uh, Mohammed Javed Azadi uh, Yeromi, said that Israel has launched these attacks today, the 5th of November, but they've been blocked by electronic countermeasures from Iran. There's been no response from Israel, if or not what he's saying is true. His declarations or his claims may be part of the current Iranian propaganda campaign. Now, understand the Iranian campaign with Khomeini going into the cockpit on the assembly line of a uh, Iranian-made jet, or the speeches being made by Iranian generals, or the war talk as a response to the American embargoes and their ramifications. This kind of propaganda is not really for international consumption. It's not something that's going to be widely believed by anybody. It's made for domestic consumption. It's made for the people of Iran to make them think their government is stronger than it actually is and in a better capacity to retaliate against America, Israel, moderate Arabs, etc., than it actually is. Nonetheless, these things are all transpiring, and they are transpiring this week in prophecy. The effects of these embargoes are going to be remarkable. Will the United States continue to push Iran in the direction of becoming the next Libya? the next Venezuela, a collapsing economy with nothing but internal division and unrest as a result of the values of its government. As Mr. Pompeo said, you will either stop your belligerent behavior and your sponsorship of terror and your drive to acquire weapons of mass destruction, or you will face economic chaos. A further question concerns this coalition of certain European governments, including allies of the United States, Russia, and China, to attempt to circumvent the effects of the American embargo. Everyone knows it cannot possibly work. Everyone knows that industries and corporations, banking institutions, are not going to want to face an enforced boycott barring them from the American market in order to do business in Iran. Everyone knows that. 
they're not in a position to do anything except to complain, in effect. But it is not impossible that the United States, through NATO, is supporting officially the opposition to the American boycotts by European countries in order to obligate Iran or compel Iran to continue to keep its treaty commitments. Now, the treaty commitments are largely bogus anyway. They were totally ineffective, did not allow for inspections. They did very little good, but what little good they actually did would be left intact if Iran continued to have to comply with it. So you have a situation now that Mr. Trump has created where we're not going to keep this horrific Obama treaty that was never approved by the Senate, but you're going to have to keep it because of the Europeans. They seem like they're against us, but they're working in tandem with us. You'll have to keep the agreement. We won't. If nothing else, Mr. Trump is extremely clever. He thinks like a businessman, not like a stupid politician. He also understands that to win wars, to win wars, you take politicians out and you put generals in. This is not to say that in a democracy, the military is not to be controlled by the civilian leadership. But the civilian leadership is the elected commander in chief primarily and constitutionally. He's had more success with North Korea than any other president. He's having more success in dealing with Iran than any other president. He's resented for his success. On the economic front, likewise, his opponents resent him for his success. They're becoming incensed. Their lies are falling apart. The average Afro-American family's earnings declined by $900 after two terms of Barack Obama and increased by $1,000 after 11 months of Donald Trump. Hispanic Americans realize that people coming up in caravans from Central America are going to take their jobs. Fifty-three percent of women voted for Donald Trump. The National Organization of Women, the feminist movement, Me Too, none of these organizations, they don't speak for all women. They lie to themselves and they lie through the mainstream media, but they don't speak for all women. Neither do people like Jesse Jackson or Al Sharpton or Cory Booker or Camilla Harris speak for all blacks. Neither does Whoopi Goldberg speak for all blacks. Senator Tim Daniels is an Afro-American. Congresswoman Love from Utah is an Afro-American. Larry Elder is an Afro-American. Dr. Thomas Sowell is an Afro-American. Professor Walter Williams is an Afro-American. There are growing numbers of blacks who see through the lies and manipulation of the left. The battle is not simply intellectual or political or even financial. Who spends the most money on advertising? The battle is spiritual. We see a godless left-wing Jew, George Soros, funding radical left-wing political activity within the Democratic Party and without of it. We see a conservative Jew who believes in God, who's friendly to evangelicals, and who is supportive of Israel, Shemuel Edelson, who's, substantial, who's essentially as wealthy as Soros, taking the opposite position. Jews are not all liberals. Mark Levin is Jewish. Ben Shapiro is Jewish. Michael Savage is Jewish. David Horowitz is Jewish. Dennis Prager is Jewish. 
they don't control all Jewish thought anymore. They never controlled all of it. And they don't control all black thought. And they don't control all Hispanic thought. And they don't control all women's thoughts. You'd never know that by listening to the lies of CNN or MSNBC or reading the Washington Post or the New York Times or listening to the BBC, but that is the truth. We live in an age, however, where truth, while a precious commodity, is not necessarily what wins and loses elections. Again, the battle is spiritual. Please pray for the outcome of the elections this week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless you and thank you so much for listening.